For his 83rd birthday, he is our artist of the day. This is Slow Twistin'. And with that, we get back to talking sports now as we uh, bring on, as promised, the voice of UNLV Athletics, Matt Neverett, uh, to fill us in on the Rebels. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for coming on. How are you today? Hey, doing well. Happy to help out. Really looking forward to this matchup coming up tomorrow. Yeah, should be a good one. And, you know, before we get into this game, before we get into this matchup, I have to ask you about these last couple of weeks. Can you put into words and summarize what this has been like for UNLV between Pac-12 drama and quarterback drama and being ranked and undefeated? And, I mean, what what have the last couple of weeks been like out there? Yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing up that context because it is a couple of weeks stretch like any other in the history of the UNLV football program. Not to mention, as you had said, it's the first time they've ever been ranked going through the conference realignment talk with Matthew Sluka leaving, Michael Allen, the running back, leaving in that same week due to playing time. It has been topsy-turvy, but Barry Odom and his staff have done a tremendous job of keeping it business as usual. That's kind of been the theme that's been echoed throughout the facility. And, uh, you know, it's one thing for a coach and a staff to say that and the the players to say that in the lead-up to a game and afterwards. But it it really is something that they are living out day in and day out. It's been really, really crazy to see the consistency with all the topsy-turvy nature going on. Yeah, sometimes it can be difficult to manage success. And, you know, what, 4-0 and for the first time since 1976, I believe I read, and, and as you mm-hmm. said, ranked for the first time. And, um, y- you know, they had a lot of distractions last week, and I, I don't think anybody truly knew what to expect going into that Fresno State game. And then they come out and, you know, they just they blow them out. The, you know, the new quarterback played great. The team in general played great. Um, were, were you surprised at how well they played given all the distractions they had last week, or is that just a credit to this coaching staff and these players? You know, I was a little bit uh, higher on Haj Malik Williams in fall camp than most. I don't think a lot of people realize just how tight the quarterback competition between him and Matthew Sluka was. So, you know, I'll, I'll tell you guys, I thought they were going to be fine with Haj Malik Williams on the offensive side. <laughs> to be totally honest, I didn't think they'd be that fine. I mean, it was a bludgeoning from start to finish. Uh, Hans Rilik Williams gets all the credits that, that, that he deserves with a couple of touchdown passes and a touchdown run himself. Uh, the defense was tremendous, forcing four turnovers as well. And then the special teams, two special teams touchdowns. Also, uh, UNLV consistently over the last two seasons under Barry Odom has had one of, if not the best, special teams in all of college football. And that reared its head last week again. So it was a truly a full team effort, but really the, the spearhead was was Haj Malik Williams who took over a quarterback. Everybody kind of rallied around him to be sure. I don't want to put you in a tough spot, but I do have to ask you about Matthew Sluka. So I don't know what you can say about it, what you know about it. Um, you know, we, we've we read a lot of stuff, right, in the media about his, what his dad said and, and, you know, what the young man said and, the, and what he uh, said publicly in a release and, and the university responded in a release. What can you tell us about what happened with Matthew Sluka and how it went south seemingly so quickly, like out of the blue, all of a sudden he he wasn't playing? You know, and it's just an unfortunate situation because at the end of the day, what is best for all of these guys is getting out there on the field and doing what they love and doing what they've been born to do and they've been doing their whole lives. So it, it really is just an, an unfortunate situation that it played out the way that it did and it really is endemic of the situation right now with the NIL system in, in college football. It, it is the Wild West. I mean, we are out here in the Wild West in Vegas, but it is literally the Wild West as far as the, the legislation for the NIL. So, you know, it's kind of a, a he said, he said, she said, uh, depending on what was in writing and what was not, um, you know, you would be fortunate enough to have a, a, a ready to go backup quarterback uh, to step in right off the bat. But uh, yeah, definitely fortunate than that. I know a lot, a lot of other teams would not have been able to, you know, fill in as, as well and as efficiently right off the bat as, as UNLV did. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's going to basically set the scene, guys, for some kind of a change in the NIL landscape. There's, there's got to be some legislation. I, I've heard somebody compare it to, you know, uh, national uh, campaign finances and, and the way that that's run with some, some kind of a loose governing body. I think we're going to need to see something like that uh, because with the way that it is right now, whether it's UNLV or otherwise, there, there, there needs to be some kind of legislation as far as the NIL is concerned. Completely agree with you. Um, and this is not meant to take a shot at Matthew Sluka, but do you think the Rebels might actually be better off – with, again, him aside, with Haj Malik Williams, as you said, you were high on him. Do you think that the skill set he brings to the table might make UNLV a more dangerous team and more dangerous offense with him running the show? 
I mean, they're very, very similar skill sets as far as Haj Malik Williams compared to Matthew Sluka. Both of them were grad transfers. Uh, both of them had led teams and had started for multiple years at their FCS destinations before. Uh, and both of them ran really, really well. Sluka may have been more of an instinctual and uh, rangy, if you will, runner with the ball. He Sometimes, though, he would tuck it just a little bit too early. Haj Malik Williams showed off a ton of patience in the Fresno State game. He made all the right decisions in, in the RPO game as well. Uh, held the football, didn't even come close to a turnover uh, from from his side of things. So, uh, you know, maybe not better. There's also that, that motivation factor as well. The, the team was fired up. There was a huge, huge noticeable difference in the lead-up to that game as far as you, you could just tell that everybody was locked in. We do our pregame interview uh, the day of the game with, uh, with the head coach, Barry Odom, and, you know, he had the blinders on when I did that interview. You could just tell that the mood was different. Last question about this, just how the players are dealing with it. You said that the players were fired up. And, you know, we saw some of the comments afterwards backing their new quarterback opposed to their old quarterback. How are the players handling it? Like, do, do they feel as though Matthew quit on them? Do they feel as though, you know, well, he's just doing what's right for him and it's a business decision? Like, how how are they how are they dealing with the fact that all of a sudden their starting quarterback just said, I'm not playing anymore, you know, I'm I'm out of here? You know, I'm, I'm sure that there's a, a good number of players that, uh, you know, felt like, hey, you know, this guy, this guy left us. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it is with the, with the way that it's set up right now. These players have, you know, four to six seasons to maximize their value. So you got to see that side of things as well. Sure. Um, so I, I I can certainly see both sides of the coin, especially nowadays with the the lack of legislation and just the the the, the free for all that that is nil. But the team, you know, had that rallying moment and something to kind of rally around and towards. And, you know, they're, they're as motivated as ever. And that's saying something because Barry Odom has done a phenomenal job of keeping the messaging the same, keeping everybody consistent, and, uh, you know, keeping it one week at a time. That's the big thing as well. There's so much to look forward to if UNLV can have a phenomenal year and win out in the Mountain West Conference as well. You know, there is that college football playoff, and that certainly is in the back of everybody's mind. Uh, but the, the coaching staff has done such a good job of keeping everybody focused and locked in on one game at a time. All right, let's look ahead to this matchup now. And, it, you know, it's too bad. Syracuse is one play away from this being a matchup of two top 25 teams and two undefeated teams. But, they, you know, they gave up a fourth and nine late in that Stanford game. Stanford kicked a field goal. And, and so they've got that one blemish on their record. But I'm, I'm curious, in your preparation of this game, what stands out to you about Syracuse from what you've seen so far? Yeah, but unfortunate that that Syracuse uh, loss happened the way that it that it did. That long time ACC rivalry between yeah, uh, right. Syracuse and Stanford. I, I thought that was funny. Throw uh, out the yeah, records no, when they get together. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, no, no love loss there. Um, but it, it's really just going to be a fun matchup. First time ever that UNLV and Syracuse have matched up. A whole lot to like about the Syracuse team with with Kyle McCord and the way that he has run this offense. He's the most efficient passer in all of college football as of right now. Uh, this UNLV defense though has. Been been phenomenal, both against the run and the pass. It all starts and ends with Jackson Woodard, the linebacker, the team captain. He is the voice of this team uh, with all of the stuff that had been going on. He kind of was the mouthpiece and uh, the, the very, very vocal leader. He's a guy that followed Barry Odom uh, from Arkansas. He walked on in Arkansas and has now turned himself into one of the best linebackers in all of college football. Jackson Woodard cannot be ignored in that defense, as well as Jalen Cattle on the safety who uh, is, is tied for the nation's lead in picks with four. He had another one last week. If you get a chance to look up that highlight, it was one of the best interceptions I've ever seen in my life on the sideline. Uh, and then people forget about the two returning All-American wideouts in all of this. Ricky White and Jacob DeJesus both having phenomenal seasons so far. Really haven't seen them break out in the same game together, even with all the offense early on. So that's certainly something that is still in the back pocket of the offensive coordinator, Brendan Marion. Matt Neverett on Orange Nation, voice of UNLV Athletics. You touched on the defense, Matt, and I wanted to ask you about that because despite UNLV not allowing more than 20 points this season, Vegas has this as a shootout, over 60 points being scored. Uh, obviously, Kyle McCord's been one of the best quarterbacks in the nation so far this season. So do you expect this to be a shootout like the experts are predicting, or do you think it's going to be both teams around the thirties or do you expect this to maybe be lower scoring than some have projected? In my estimation, guys, I think maybe a little bit lower scoring than some people have projected. I think, you know, when you look at the, the, the over under you, the, 
uh, you know, Vegas just sees two teams that are averaging over 40 points a game so far, and uh, it kind of throws that in there. UNLV defense is underrated for sure. They have been underrated all year long. They've allowed 40 or less rush yards against two of their four, uh, two of their three uh, autonomous four, power four, whatever you want to call it, opponents. Um, so they, they have just stifled the run. When they decide to really lock down the run, they have done a phenomenal job, and it, it all is because of the additions they made in the transfer portal, especially when it comes to that defensive backfield. They completely reworked DB room this offseason, and a very rare situation where every single player that the Rebels went out and got as far as the transfers on defense, they had a home run. They, they did not miss on any of their defensive transfers. Tony Grimes, the quarterback, a former five-star Catalan from Arkansas, leads the league or the country in interceptions. Malik Chavis, the free safety. Cameron Oliver, who leads all of Mountain West cornerbacks in career interceptions. This is an under rated defensive group nationally it's, it's something that i've been you know shouting from the hilltops to anyone that'll listen i think that is really those guys and jackson woodard have been a huge huge reason why this defense has been really good i don't necessarily see this being like a 35 30 shootout I, I think both teams score i don't necessarily know if it's to that level and the orange has struggled with the run game this season so that could uh that theme could continue i got one more for you matt uh I mean, ESPN put out an article how UNLV became the unlikely center of the college football universe. And yes, there's the stuff off the field, but it's also just being ranked for the first time, being undefeated. I know a ton of Q's fans are planning on making the trip. There's Q's fans on the West Coast who are going to the game. Just what are the vibes like for the team, for the fan base, and for you being in the middle of it? What's it like covering UNLV football out there right now? I'll tell you what, it's awesome. <laughs> this is my uh, my my first year as a full time play by play guy on radio, but I've been involved with the program my whole life. Uh, I, I, born in Vegas, lived here a good good chunk of my childhood, and came back a handful of years ago. So you know, even from the five years ago that I moved back here until now, the com- the, the program has completely flipped on its head. The expectations uh, were through the floor. So now that they've got some national success, um, it is really really fun to watch. Since the Mountain West Conference was founded, guys, no team has less wins than UNLV over that 20, almost 25 years now. So this is just completely unheralded. Vegas is really starting to get behind this team as well. Uh, Playing at Allegiant Stadium is really fun. The only issue is that it's a 60,000-plus seat behemoth of a Super Bowl-hosting stadium. So, uh, you know, 30,000 would be a great crowd for a lot of other teams and a lot of other stadiums. It half fills the place. So they are trying to get more and more folks to come out. They've done a great job of re-engaging not only the local fans, but the local high schools as far as the recruiting trails. And uh, we're we're expecting close to 40,000 for this game against Syracuse, which is by far the most uh, since I've been involved with the program again and then lastly uh matt uh what does this game come down to i know you've touched on it a little bit but as we come full circle now what, what does this game come down to and if if you got a prediction who wins and why I think that if, if UNLV can stifle Kyle McCord, you're not going to completely hold him down, but if you can limit the damage that he does against you with his really big, really physical Syracuse wide receiver room, I do think UNLV has a really, really good shot. Uh, you mentioned the running game, that is something that Syracuse struggles with, UNLV cycling between four different running backs, what's been one of the interesting things about this go-go offense. Over Brennan Marion is the rotation, the really deep rotation in the running back room. You've got a guy getting his first touch of the game in the third quarter. They, they do a great job of rotating and keeping fresh legs. So I think that that is going to be a big time difference in the game, especially because that is something that Syracuse struggles with. Uh, I said it was going to be a little lower scoring. I think it's going to be close, something like 27-24, 27-21. I'm a little biased, but I, I, I think the Rebels are able to pull it out. I would not be surprised in the slightest, though, if it does turn into a shootout with a lot of points scored for both sides. Should be a good one. A really big game for both teams. I mean, UNLV looking to stay perfect. Syracuse trying to make up for that Stanford loss and get back on track 4-1 and one going back into conference play so uh, a lot on the line for both teams Matt thanks so much for the time uh, enjoy it you, you get a front row seat for it and hopefully we can uh, talk again down the road see him tomorrow all right